Hi everyone, welcome to Biomechanics on Our Minds. Welcome to Boom. We have Biomechanics on Our Minds. Boom. 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 It's episode seven. I'm six. Hannah. Six. six. Just kidding. Do it again. Do it again. It's episode six. I'm Hannah. And I'm Melissa, and we are here through the International Society of Biomechanics talking to you about the exciting things going on in biomechanics. Um, Today we have an interview with Professor Steve Collins, who just moved his lab to Stanford University from Carnegie Mellon University. So we're going to talk to him a little bit about what that transition was like and also about his research in biomechatronics. But first, we're going to start with a bit of boom. Bit of boom. Bit of boom. We've got some fun animal biomechanics for you today as our bit of boom. We sure do. Starting off with the woodpecker. So woodpeckers peck a tree at a rate of about 20 times per second, and their head actually decelerates at a speed of 1,200 Gs. And this is over 10 times the force it takes humans to get a concussion. But woodpeckers don't have any sign of brain damage. Holy cow. (laughs) And a study at the University of California, Berkeley, studied their shock-absorbing system. And they found that the structures of a woodpecker's endoskeleton, so this is their beak, the hyoid, spongy bone, and their skull, combined with the cerebral spinal fluid that surrounds it all, absorbs the mechanical excitations. And they actually designed an equivalent spring mass damper system which modeled the structure of the woodpecker's head, and then from that ended up building a bio-inspired shock-absorbing system. And so this system consisted of a high-strength layer that protected it from physical damage, which would be like the beak, and then a a viscoelastic layer to distribute the mechanical excitations, followed by a porous structure, which would be similar to that of spongy bone, and then another high-strength layer with a porous structure like the skull bone. And the system that they built was able to survive a mechanical excitation of 60,000 Gs, which is incredible. And it's another really cool example of how we can learn and design from nature. And so Hannah's going to follow up with another animal-inspired bit of boom. Yeah, so in honor of it being the start of summer, happy summer, everyone. Woo! And Well, for this, um, this hemisphere... It's true. I'm sorry. I was not sensitive to the <laughs> to the international audience that Boom hosts for. So yeah. I'm sorry. Um, in honor of it being summer in our hemisphere, um, and many people are going to the beach, and Shark Week is coming up on Discovery Channel. I love that. Shark oh, Week. Yes. I thought we would do a little bit of shark biomechanics. So Camp and some colleagues from Brown, the University of Alaska at Anchorage, and the University of Illinois found that sharks actually use their shoulders to shrug to swallow their food to help them pull it back through their digestive systems. So essentially they have this long pharynx and they have to keep food moving down it just like we do but right. we um, we do so with our tongues and since they don't have tongues they need to control the motion of the fluid within their mouths to actually manipulate the food and get it down oh, to where it needs that's to go. Pretty interesting. Isn't that really cool? So the group actually studied these uh, bamboo sharks and their shoulders which are just essentially a U-shaped girdle of cartilage and some attached muscles. And they found that they use the this system for feeding as well as to control the frontmost fins for locomotion, which is what you'd think you'd use your shoulders for. You wouldn't really think they'd be useful for, for helping you swallow. Yeah, that's a good point. And also, I've never thought of sharks to have shoulders, so that's pretty <laughs> So yeah, and that, and that they can shrug. They can <laughs> shrug. <laughs> Brush it off. <laughs> Everyone should have the Everyone ability should, to shrug. To shrug, and it helps them eat, you know? Um <laughs> But what's really cool is that they made these observations using a technology developed at Brown called X-ray reconstruction of moving morphology, or X-ROM. And this system combines CT scans of the skeleton with high-speed, high-resolution X-ray movies that are also aided by little implanted metal markers, sort of like um, the reflective markers we use in motion capture, except these are implanted in the body and fixed to rigid structures. So they're much more precise and help us visualize how the bones and muscles are actually moving within animals and people. 
What's really cool is this technology is also used to study skin artifact in motion capture. So you can compare the actual positions of the bones Mm -hmm. at certain times with what we're getting from our typical motion capture system. So with this XROM, scientists could see inside the sharks as they fed, and they measured a surprising swing in the shoulder, shoulder girdle of all three sharks tested. Just a fraction of a second after the mouth closed, the cartilage quickly rotated backward from head to tail by about 11 degrees. And this suction feeding mechanism in sharks was really cool to study with this system. And it was a a real discovery that they were moving their shoulders in this way. And it was not only helping them with swimming, but also with feeding. This is important because it helps us understand how fish skeletal structure evolved and can even help explain how creatures become capable of making it to land. It has been a bit of a repeating theme that Hannah and I enjoy talking about animal biomechanics. We can uh, attempt to mix this up. This week, actually, it was purely coincidence that we both came in with animal biomechanics topics. We didn't talk to (laughs) each other about about it beforehand. (laughs) But there is a really cool quote by Michael Behe that says, The strong appearance of design in nature allows a disarmingly simple argument. If it looks and walks and quacks like a duck, then absent compelling evidence to the contrary, we have warrant to conclude it's a duck. And design should not be overlooked simply because it's so obvious. And this reminded me of a workshop that I went to recently that was on improv and one of the tips that he said was dare to be obvious and I thought this was a really cool point because a lot of times we want to come up with these really elaborate designs and we're kind of embarrassed to say the most obvious design or the most obvious idea that we have but a lot of times in nature it's something so simple and elegant and can work very well for designs that we want to use. Yeah, that is so beautiful. I feel like everyone always jumps to the app or the tech or something that can solve some problem even. Yeah. And just like trying to figure out the most simple solution. There was an example in a design school class I was taking um, a couple of years ago in that they couldn't keep track of where different doctors were in the hospital or something. So they wanted to propose this whole like tracking system for like in the doctor's ID badge, there would be like a little GPS or, you know, RFID so they could tell where they were at the hospital at all times. But really, oh, wow. all they needed was for people to learn their names. Then you could ask someone, hey, where's so and so? So they just improved name tag visibility and things like that. So, like a simple oh, wow, thing so to help people see where other people are. You don't have to come up with a really technological solution yeah. that's going to track everyone. You can just use your current knowledge and be like, hey, hey where's Melissa? I'm here. <laughs> Recording boom. (laughs) What I do instead of research nowadays. And now we're going into our interview with Professor Steve Collins. Today we're talking with Steve Collins from Stanford University, where he directs the Stanford Biomechatronics Lab. Thanks for taking the time to talk with us today. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks for putting this podcast together. I'm excited about it. Yeah, we are too. Um, In your bio page, it says that your primary focus is to speed and systematize the design and prescription of prosthetics and exoskeletons using versatile device emulator hardware and human-in-the-loop optimization algorithms. There are a lot of kind of big science-y words here, and we are wondering how you would define biomechatronics to someone who doesn't see these words every day. Sure. Well, so the, the, the pieces of the word kind of tell you uh, what it means. There's biological elements in the system and uh, mechanical elements and electronic elements in the system. And in our lab, we're really focused on, as you said, exoskeletons and prosthetic limbs. So you've got the person, they bring biology to the table. You've got this mechanical interface that's forcefully pushing on the person. The person's pushing back. And then electrical interfaces, you measure, say, muscle activity and control motors and uh, have other sensors in the person. And so we study how to make this full system work well to best, uh, in in our case, improve locomotor performance for the person who's wearing it. And to put that in slightly less (laughs) jargony terms, um, really what we're doing is figuring out ways uh, to put robots on people's legs to help them walk better. Um, Yeah, yeah. that's great. Can you give an example of um, what type of people would use these robots? Yeah, we we work a lot with people with amputation. So they've uh, had a part of their limb, their leg surgically removed uh, due to injury or disease. And so we're trying to put a replacement foot and ankle and uh, and part of the shank back in place that restores function. 
And uh, it's, it's really challenging. Uh, people are really complicated, and it's hard to predict how they're going to respond to some new device. Yeah. So we've been focused uh, really on the design methods for these, uh, these technologies. Um, and as you mentioned, so we, have, we use these emulator systems, we call them. It's like this prosthesis that you uh, strap on, and it's connected to these big off-board motors and computers. Uh, so it's sort of like a our, back in the day we used to call it superfoot. Uh, <laughs> that process- sounds exciting. Yeah, <laughs> so Incredible. it can kind of do anything, right? And you don't, and so you can try any crazy idea that you might have about how to help somebody uh, walk or run better. And um, but there are lots of things you could try. So mm-hmm. to try to figure out which things are best, we develop these algorithms that sort of measure the person's response in real time while they're using it, and then change what the device does so that uh, you can, it identifies the, 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 the best behavior, the best design characteristics for that person. Mm-hmm. So it's sort of discovering new ways of, of helping people and customizing that assistance to people's individual needs. So that's the, that's the optimization part that you would, yeah. Exactly, yeah. Wow. Awesome. That's really awesome. It sounds like you need a lot of uh, background in a lot of different fields to work in your lab. Um, so let's just let's just look at your background um, on your education. So I see you've received your BS in mechanical engineering mm-hmm. from Cornell, and you perform research on passive dynamic walking robots there. And then you received your PhD in mechanical engineering from University of Michigan, focusing on the dynamics and control of human walking, and then went on to do your postdoc research on humanoid robots in the Netherlands. So you've got quite an expansive background. Um, if you'd just like to talk about what it was like to do your postdoc in the Netherlands, I think that'd be super interesting for us oh, to hear about. Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, so, uh, I mean, t- just to address your first point about drawing from lots of fundamental areas, this is a really interdisciplinary field. And uh, to make progress, we feel like we need contributions from people who have more of a medical background, Mm -hmm. uh, kinesiology and biomechanics, mechanical engineering, robotics, electrical engineering, computer science. So it it is really interdisciplinary. But don't let that scare you off. Um, (laughs) Nobody comes into our lab having the full skill set. Uh, we take people from each of these disciplines and then you, you know, pick up the parts of the complementary disciplines as you go. And, and that's kind of been my path. As you said, I started in robotics and then I went to a biomechanics lab and tried to apply the things we learned from walking robots to prosthetic limbs that uh, help people. And I, I learned a lot along the way, uh, 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 mostly about how little I knew about people. <laughs> yeah, it's important to know. <laughs> yeah. And went and then came back to robotics for a little while in the Netherlands, uh, working with uh, Martijn Visse there in uh, at Delft, and uh, it was a really interesting experience. Uh, I, I encourage so so you're uh, on the way to making a decision like this at some point in the next few years, mm-hmm. right? Hopefully, <laughs> I'm sure. Knock on someone. <laughs> and it's a great opportunity to go do something really different and live in a new place. And uh, my wife and I really loved our time in the Netherlands. It it was culturally quite different. For example, I was accustomed to being in the lab at all hours, uh, you know, working late into the evening many times. And Dutch students left at 5 p.m. sharp every day. Oh, wow. And wow. the university is just uh, deserted on the weekends and evenings. So their philosophy was you know, between 9 and 5, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be really working hard, very focused. And then the rest of the time, I'm going to have a good balance with the rest of my life. And I, I think it works really well. And I, I try to encourage my students to have a good balance. Uh, and, and everybody's different. You know, maybe you're not going to check out at five every day, but it's important to have that, that balance. You can really focus and be at your best when you are working. Yeah, that's true. When you say that you learned about how much or how little you knew about people. Did you mean in terms of designing devices for people or just people from different cultures? Oh, I, I mean, I was, I was talking as a scientist uh, yeah. about the human body. Uh, yeah. I, so something you see a lot in my area, in prosthetics and exoskeletons, most of the people that design these devices, they have a robotics background. Mm. And we kind of look at the way people move. We have bodies, we use them, and we, we sort of think we understand how it works. And it turns out to be hubris a lot of the time, right? We yeah. we th- think that people are like robots, and they're really not. Uh, muscles are not like motors, and uh, our nervous system is not like 
uh, a computer. So, uh, and those differences really matter. So, uh, coming to that understanding, I think it was a painful process with a lot of failures along the way, uh, yeah. but really shaped the direction uh, of the research that we do now. Yeah. Yeah. And it sounds humbling too to kind of. I think that often I feel overwhelmed in research when I come across this like problem of, oh, wow, I really actually don't know anything about what I thought I knew. But it's humbling because then you can kind of start from, from ground zero and, and work your way through. So Absolutely. Yeah, that's, a, that's an important feature of the scientist to, uh, to fail like that or to recognize this big uh, lack of knowledge, ignorance in yourself. And instead of sort of uh, shying away from it or feeling defensive, embracing that and saying, all right, I'm going to learn this. You know, we're going we're to do this better. This is a new direction for us, you know. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I think a lot of times we're kind of hesitant to have those failures, but it definitely is a great learning experience. So we're also wondering what it's been like to move to another university with your transition from being a professor of mechanical engineering and robotics at Carnegie Mellon University for seven years until just recently, last year, you joined the Faculty of Mechanical Engineering at Stanford University. Uh, it's hard. Um, I think the, the analogy that I like best after talking about this a lot is, uh, uh, let's say you want a tree, an oak tree over there. One way to do it is to plant an acorn, and it just grows there naturally and puts down roots and everything. Um, another way is to, like, um, you've got to wait 10 years. The other way is to find a 10-year-old tree and pick it up and move it over there. And there's just no way to do that without causing some damage, right? So yeah. it's, you know, it's been a painful process for the group. And I think the best piece of advice I had going into this, I, I didn't appreciate it at the time. Um, so I'll, I'll give it to other people who probably also won't appreciate it. But you know, that's, <laughs> that's how you do that's it. That's how advice works, right? <laughs> right. Um, my old advisor at Michigan Art Quo said, he had just moved to Calgary, and he said, you're going to lose a year. And if you accept that, you're going to be fine. So you're going to work really hard to try to make the transition as smooth as possible, but just because of all the complex details that need to be worked out to get your research operation up and running again and learn the new university culture, learn the new courses, and, and, and so on, it's just going to take you a long time, and, and you're going to you know, have a, a loss of your productivity. And that's fine. Um, uh, and I, I didn't really embrace that, as I said. I <laughs> thought I could outsmart the system. And no, you, you just you, you work hard, and, and eventually we're getting back up to speed. Our lab is almost built here at, at, uh, at Sanford, and uh, we're, we'll be opening in a few weeks. Woo! And yeah, we're pretty excited about it, yeah. Have to have an open house celebration. Yeah, oh, <laughs> definitely. You guys are invited. Thank you so much. That yeah. would be great. So yeah. Just thinking about what you said, it sounds like, I don't know, it'd be really nice if there was some kind of like handbook or something you got when you came to Stanford, like here's the, or the, here's the secret oh, handbook. No. <laughs> no. There's no handbook. There's no handbook. <laughs> not when you start and wow. not when you transfer. No, I mean, you got to pick it up as you go. So I, I think it took... When I first started as a faculty member, I don't, are you guys considering uh, a career in, in academia? Yeah, possibly. It's not off the table, but it sounds intimidating, I think, is from no, where we sit no. here. <laughs> well, so Looking that's, at people like you guys who have, <laughs> yeah, are yeah. Just really established and exactly. well, so, yeah, so, have it so all figured out. <laughs> you work with Scott. And, yeah, exactly. And so, you know, you're looking at two labs with you know, kind of crazy PIs that are just taking on way too much all the time and, and you know, really yep. <laughs> gung-ho personas, but not everybody in faculty is like that. You can have a great career and not and, and have good balance in your life and be very happy. And, mo you know, most of my friends in academia have that approach. So don't be turned off <laughs> by the turbo crazy people. Like <laughs> um, but anyway, so if you if you do go in, uh, it, you know, it just takes a couple of years. You ha there's a lot to the job. So uh, in that first year, you kind of get surprised by all these new things that you have to be good at. And then the second year, you see them all again. And, oh, okay. and then after <laughs> maybe two years, you, s you can see the job completely and wow. you feel comfortable doing everything you need to do. Yeah. Oh, wow. So was transitioning at all similar to starting a new faculty position? It was. I think it was easier than starting a new position. Yeah. Wow. Be because you sort of have the categories um, in your mind. You, you know the kinds of things that you can expect to deal with. Right. Yeah. You're just adapting kind of to whatever the new system is. Or yeah. And the new culture. 
yes, the, there are differences in the students and uh, the faculty and expectations. Um, but you know, Stanford's an awesome, obviously you guys know Stanford's an awesome university. I'm re- really glad to be here. That's cool. Yeah, well, we're happy to have you here. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit more about your research. Right now, it seems like the only way to try to optimize a prosthetic or exoskeleton device is to use metabolics to measure efficiency and then tune the device accordingly. And this is something that can only be done in a lab. And so we're wondering if you expect this to change in the future where someone could have an exosuit and it would be able to optimize for a person outside of the lab. Yeah, that's that's a great question. Uh, I think, and there, there are two, kind of two things I would say in response. So first metabolic rate isn't the only thing that matters, mm-hmm. right? So mm-hmm. people do care about the effort it takes to walk or run, um, but they also care about how fast they can go and how stable they feel. And those are other measures that we try to improve with optimization uh, in our devices. And with, with, it, we had some success in, in balance augmentation for people with uh, amputation, mm-hmm. um, and we're starting to get into an increasing speed. And those are a bit easier to take outside the laboratory uh, because yeah. you can use like an inertial measurement unit, like the you know IMU in your phone or something, and get a pretty good estimate of how fast a person is going. Right. And if you put similar stuff into the prosthesis or exoskeleton, right. you can measure like foot placement variability, which indicates uh, balance. Now, metabolic rate is a little trickier. <laughs> but uh, actually, as it happens, we're collaborating with Scott and um, some faculty in computer science here, uh, trying to look at uh, which other signals from the body that can be collected out in the field um, are good indicators of mm-hmm. your total energy expenditure. So I'm hopeful that in the next five years or so, we'll uh, nail this and, and be able to reliably estimate energy costs without the mask um, in the lab. Right. Just thinking about that and all of these wearable devices that are everywhere. Everyone's wearing a Fitbit and people are, one of my friends looks at our heart rate every like five minutes. Mm. (laughs) Um, So I'm wondering, do you think metabolic cost or, you know, energy efficiency will be a thing that people are starting to monitor on their themselves on a a daily basis or even, you know, know, that would be really cool. Shorter time scale. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, that would, be, that would be awesome. Yeah. T- so it, instead of looking at the number of steps at the end exactly, of the day, you look yeah. at the number of calories burned through activity. Right. Uh, and, and uh, you know, we, there, there are estimates right now, but they're yeah, extremely yeah. approximate. <laughs> I bad. heard, yeah the, yeah. the standard deviation is very high on that, I heard. Right. Yeah, that'd be great. So sometimes it seems like exoskeletons and robotics in general can be a little intimidating to people. And I was wondering how you navigate this problem. Well, uh, you mean uh, for people that might use the device? Either pe- both people that use the device, and then I think the public in general. Sometimes mm-hmm. you see a photo of this crazy exosuit on someone, and it's it's can be kind of scary or um, seem a little out there, I guess. Sure. Uh, well, I, I think you know attitudes are slowly changing. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we're, we're becoming through pop culture, we're becoming more comfortable with the idea of robots that help us and uh, exoskeletons and other devices that we can wear that help us to do the things we want to do. Um, I, I, when, when I was a kid, you know, I had some family members with amputation, and their prosthetic limbs uh, were uh, aimed towards cutsemesis. So they, they, they looked um, as much like a, a, a natural limb as possible. Uh, and now the participants that come through our laboratory they don't have like the cosmetic cover. They, you see the metal. You see the sh- many times the shiny mm-hmm. carbon fiber yeah. socket. They get artwork on it. You know, <laughs> That's and really cool. yeah, yeah. Nice. yeah it, it's cool. I mean prosthetic limbs are cool and they're getting cooler <laughs> yeah. all the time. Yeah. So that's so. Hopefully, we'll have some changes in the culture. Um, yeah. But but it's true that I mean, there's not only the just the perhaps intimidating uh, factor, but but also, I mean, to use one of these devices, you have to put it on. Maybe you have to charge it. Mm-hmm. Other things like that. So there, there's some uh, burden. There's there's some hurdle to overcome um, in in using these things. So the benefits of the devices have to be really high mm. in order for people to actually use them. And right. you see this in like upper extremity prosthetics. Uh, we've got these 
create, you know, cool, like, 20 degree of freedom robotic hands and wrists. Yeah, yeah. But uh, people who get prescribed these devices uh, largely don't use them because they're heavy and you have to charge it and so on. And they, they get by pretty well that with using no device or using one of the more traditional uh, devices based on relative movement elsewhere in the body. Yeah. Actually, my grandma had a prosthetic arm. She lost her arm in an accident, and it was really cool growing up. Um, she started with just a very stiff plastic arm that kind of looked like an arm but had no function. And I always remember her trying to pick me up with it and her like plastic fingers kind of jabbing me in the ribs. <laughs> and then she moved on to – she had a hook, and that was kind of scary looking. Um, and then eventually one that, that kind of moved, but looking at – how quickly the prosthetics are progressing and the things that are going on now, it's its really exciting and seems really promising and um, will hopefully really improve the quality of life for these people. Absolutely. And I, I, I think we are kind of approaching that, that trade-off point where some of these robotic devices provide enough of a benefit that it's worth the, the added hassle. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. That's cool. Do you guys, talking about this culture, I hadn't really thought too much about it. I work with uh, different populations with neurological disease, and they have different support groups, and that is a whole other culture on how they see their disease progression and how they feel about themselves and their community. So have you interacted with your lab uh, with this community and this culture, um, and what is that like? Oh, yeah. Well, so in Pittsburgh, we were active with this thing called AMP UP, which was an amputee support group. And we go and talk about our research and people were really interested and, and engaged. And, 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 and we learned a lot about, you know, some of the things that we hadn't thought about that were yeah. challenges. Uh, like walking in the ice and snow is pretty tough with the prosthetic foot. Yeah. How do you know when a device that is interacting with people is good enough to be released for human use? Uh, so that's a good question. I, we, we're, you know, a scientific research lab, so we're just trying to make them better and better and better. And we interface with the private sector to try to transition some of these technologies into products. But you know, we're not we're not selling them ourselves. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'd say in the last year or two, it, again, I feel like we're really uh, we're seeing a tipping point here. Um, I, I guess it's, in one of our recent studies, wearing an, a powered exoskeleton on one ankle improved energy economy by about 24 percent compared to uh, wearing the device turned off. And that's a big change. Yeah, that's incredible. So we're starting to get to the the kinds of improvements in performance where uh, you could see someone actually paying for a device and and taking the time to put it on. So, you know, we're we're talking with, um, this is a great place, obviously, the Bay Area, (laughs) to uh, talk to people who want to start companies and and commercialize the technology, and, and we're pretty excited about the potential there. So I just have a quick question about what you just said. I think that I am not familiar with this field or this this part of our field as much as other people, so forgive it if it's simple. But when people talk about optimization and um, energy cost and they say there's a 25% improvement, mm-hmm. and I believe you 100% that is significant, but if I'm trying to understand that in a kind of physiological sense, does that mean I can walk 25% longer or does that mean farther? Or like, h- how can you give me a sense for how that translates into? That is a very good question. Yeah. So, uh, and we have limited data uh, to answer it. So the the indications are that, yes, you'll be able to go, say, 25% faster okay. or um, at least 25% farther. But um, mostly, since we haven't had devices that improve energy economy, we've mostly tested this idea by uh, ma- making your economy worse. <laughs> so adding weight to your to your uh, nice. shoes and things like that. Um, and you know, it, and there's nice uh, work showing that, say, if you add 100 grams of mass to a runner's shoe, um, their their energy cost goes up by one percent, and their their peak speed decreases by 1%. Oh. Uh, and it sort of incrementally goes like that. So um, uh, it, we think so. <laughs> but what we really need uh, to answer, uh, so this is one of a bunch of questions we'd like to try to answer with devices that are out in the community. Mm-hmm. So, and, and to get there, uh, in, we wanted to do that right away. And that was, you know, when I was a PhD student, uh, 
16 years ago. Um, that was, uh, you know, our first project was uh, the design of a prosthesis that could be taken out into the world. It was really energy efficient. It just that it didn't help people walk, actually. So, uh, and we're finally getting to the point where we understand what those devices need to do, and we can start making robust tools that can be taken out into the community. We can log this sort of data and find out, do people walk faster? Do people walk more? Yeah. Um, if, if every step is a little bit easier, you might take a lot more steps in a day, at so many more steps that you actually expend more energy uh, walking and get more exercise. And this is something that uh, you know, we think may be true based on some of our pilot studies with adding weight to people's shoes and some stuff with electric assist bikes. But uh, we're just getting to the point where we have the, the tools to be able to answer those questions. That's really cool. It's really cool to th or interesting to think about, I'm going to save energy, but I'm going to walk more. Like, yeah, that's, that's super cool. And it's really a psychology experiment, right? Right. It's yeah, that's true. <laughs> behavioral yeah. study. Yeah. Right. If you make it easier, do people want to do it more? Yeah. Yeah, I remember Scott saying recently that there's been um, – a lot of debate over using um, some prosthetics in the Olympics because now they're possibly better than human performance. And um, while the debate isn't necessarily positive, Scott was saying that it really is a great win for um, the biomechanics field because they're now being able to build things that could possibly outperform human capabilities, which is really cool. Yeah, yeah. And that's kind of our goal. Uh, yeah. We don't want to just restore performance we want to outperform unassisted people yeah so do you see healthy individuals possibly using exoskeletons in the future sure well i mean so i've got a younger brother he's 10 years younger than me and he he runs marathons uh he ran the boston uh last year and i would love to be able to get out there and kind of keep pace with him just, on, just you know, just for a few miles, you know, <laughs> and uh, that's not going to happen without some assistance. So, yeah, I, I think there are a lot of applications where it'd be fun for um, unimpaired people to use these things. Yeah, yeah, that does sound Definitely, fun. Yeah, <laughs> brains versus brawn, right? <laughs> so, if someone is interested in learning biomechatronics, how would you suggest that they learn more about it or can get more involved in the field? Well, I, I think you pick a piece of the discipline that's most interesting to you and mm -hmm. start there. Um, you know, especially if you pursue a degree in engineering as an undergraduate student or um, even in high school, getting involved in like first robotics, mm -hmm. uh, doing, you know, focusing on your math and physics courses and uh, biology. Um, and then there's probably, uh, you know, when you get to college, there's probably somebody doing something in this broad area. It's a really popular topic at the moment. And volunteer and uh, spend some time in the lab. Uh, the way I got involved was very heavily on the mechanical engineering and robotic side of things. Um, I had this great professor as a, at Cornell, uh, Andy Ruina, who is just so geeked about <laughs> dynamics. It was infectious. Yeah. <laughs> and... Um, so I so I started working on these walking robots. You know, I just came to him after class one day and said, "Can I volunteer in your lab this summer?" And um, you know, and it, and it clicked and worked out. And and then you know, as a as a PhD student, I want to take that and 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 put it towards something that would directly more directly help people. Right. So you can come to it from lots of different angles. Um, don't be intimidated by the. Uh, seeming complexity. Uh, I know you are not, but uh, for the listeners out there who are uh, interested in, in this area, go for it. Yeah, come on in. The, it's <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Yeah, that's some um, awesome advice. Thank that's you. Advice. Um, so we talked a little bit about failing in biomechanics, and so we were wondering if you have a research fail from your experience or some hmm. fun experience that you could share with us and how you learned from that. Yeah, so you mentioned that you were going to ask me about this, and yes. I thought about it a lot. I, I, so first, I have to say that there is no failing in research, right? Uh, yeah. Just philosophically, you can make mm -hmm. zero progress, uh, but you can't like you can't make negative progress. Every, everything, if it goes wrong, you learn something almost yeah. always. Even if you make a mistake and you don't measure something that you know, when you're That's writing the paper, you wish you'd measured that thing. I, you're re better prepared for the next study, right. and you and you're telling people uh, 
who read your paper, oh, we wish that we'd done this, and, and maybe they'll, they'll do it. Mm-hmm. So it's, I think it's pretty hard to fail, actually. Um, and every design you try that doesn't help the person, that's one more thing to check off the list, right? Yeah. And maybe you discover some philosophical problem with the whole design approach and tackle that instead. So there kind of is no such thing as failure. But uh, to be game with your question, <laughs> um, it, Andy loves to show this video from when I was an undergraduate student. Oh, that sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to get the video from him. <laughs> so this was a long time ago, and uh, and it was like VHS video <laughs> recording era. And, and he, um, he had the philosophy that we should always have the video running whenever we were doing experiments with the robot or tinkering with it. So I would have that little hand cam- camcorder staring at me and the robot for many, many hours. And in one of those moments, I'm working on this you know, minimally powered walking robot, and it's walking down the ramp. It you know, takes several steps, and I start to get a little overconfident and drop, you know, sort of take a step back, and it trips and falls down. And I, I dive after it, and, and oh, but it, it hits the ground and breaks, and I pick it back up and set it on the ramp, and then you start to see the magic smoke coming out of the electronics. <gasps> oh, no. <laughs> and I like, pull, quickly try and pull the battery out, and then, uh, you know, I, I uh, used some vulgarities and expressed my... Uh, that were captured on the video. They, oh, yes, <laughs> very much. Uh, but it's, yeah, I mean, it, so, and his point in, in that is, is usually, like, uh, that you just have to keep grinding away to, to make progress in these projects um, and that there are going to be some of these, you know, momentary setbacks, but also that, um, you know, you should be passionate about your research. Mm-hmm. So, um, and, and that's okay to, yeah. to, to really be emotionally invested. <laughs> Passion keeps you going, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. So the question we like to end the interview with is what are you most excited about for the future of biomechanics? Uh, in the future of biomechanics, oh, uh, I wasn't ready for this or one. Or biomechatronics. This is biomechanics on our minds. <laughs> <laughs> what is on oh, your that's mind? True. <laughs> well, uh, so I'm going to take this a little bit more in a robotics direction because that's fair. Sure. Um, the the thing that I'm most excited about is uh, this big set of new basic technologies that are being developed in robotics that will be really good for wearable devices. Uh, the, the re- this revolution in soft robotics and you know, soft exosuits um, and um, new forms of actuator that are more appropriate to the kinds of movements uh, that, that uh, people uh, in, engage in, you know, not sort of the assembly line robots that we've been hacking in, in, into these devices. And people are, are really understanding the challenges there and taking them on head on. And I think in the next, you know, five or 10 years, you're going to see big changes in the tools available to biomechanists who are trying to solve problems for their, for their patients. I've seen a lot of different soft robotics in one um, in the Okamura lab is the, the vine robot. Hmm. Is that, yeah, it's, um, it can kind of slither like a, like a snake or something like that, right? It can, yeah, yeah, exactly. So what are you guys most excited about for the future of biomechanics? Oh. Yeah, I think that I was kind of thinking along the same lines as far as tools for biomechanics and that I work with inertial measurement units or IMUs, as you mentioned earlier. And I think I'm really excited that biomechanics is now moving outside the lab. And especially I work with a patient population. um, So being able to study and monitor them outside the lab, especially seeing how how they're interacting with their natural environments is is really exciting to me right on yeah 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 i agree and just being able to translate research from the lab to outside i think is really exciting and i think that there'll be a better connection between what is needed and actually being able to um, help people in a clinical setting and then what's going on in the research lab um which has been a problem for right always Mm -hmm. um but I'm hoping that that can improve in the future. And I, I think it is so far. And, and 
even like platforms like this, like the podcast where you can reach out and and talk to people, I think is really exciting. But from a technical standpoint, I would also agree with being able to actually take measurements outside of the lab and understand what's going on in day-to-day life, I think is, is really exciting. Yeah, that is a big deal. Yeah. I think that when sometimes when I think about robotics, I, I think about all those walking competitions where the robots all are falling down <laughs> and things like that. And I guess one of my questions for you, an expert in that field, is how far are we from being truly humanoid, I guess, or in, in, a, in as good of a sense of humanoid as, as you would like to see? You mean how far are the robots yes. from uh, being able to duplicate human behavior? Yes. Well, I think you know the videos t- tell uh, tell a, a substantial part of that story, um, but then there are also the videos out of Boston Dynamics, right? Right. Which have uh, robots with two legs and two arms that can do stuff I can't do, like a backflip. Yeah, yeah that's uh, a pretty amazing video. That is where, an amazing I guess video. I could have practice probably, but you know, <laughs> uh, and 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 that robot had a lot of practice, but still, there there. It, you know, soon we will see robots that have the same morphology as people that can do things that people can't do. That of the same, and robots can already do lots of things people can't do, yeah. but <laughs> things that sort of feel like the domain of humans. You know, yeah. Um, and I increasingly, uh, and this is a debate uh, that I've been having with a few other uh, people in the field, faculty, and and um, some people in, in starting companies and stuff. Uh, I feel like uh, increasingly humanoid robotics belongs in the private sector more than really? in it's well it, it so in order to make a, a robot do something impressive like that there's a lot of systems integration involved there's a lot of engineering yeah. it's not it's not scientific research mm. it's not what pe- uh, people are in academia are best at mm. we're you know we're good at trying to address uh, questions that are open ended we don't know if there's an answer uh, it could be a total failure it's high risk high reward um, these long term kinds of, kinds of questions and you know um, and in the private sector they're really good at doing the necessary steps to make a product and bringing to bear lots of resources lots of people lots of money yeah and so stuff when, when it when it gets to the phase where we kind of know what we're doing and you just need lots of people to to pound it out to to make a thing really robust that's that belongs yeah i do find sure. the ethical side of it really interesting and in where we should draw the line if we should and who gets to decide that um kind of how far we should go with this technology oh yeah sure. well so then that's a whole can of worms <laughs> yeah. uh, the ethics of robotics i mean it's and it really i think it's a political challenge for us, right? It's a mm-hmm. societal challenge. Um, certainly, you can see a near future where uh, a whole lot of the necessary work in our society is done by computers and robots. And um, how is that going to affect our economy and, and, and so on? I, fortunately, the kinds of robots that we're building are intended to directly assist people. So we, we don't have to wrestle with that as much. Right. But uh, it, it's something important that we're going to have to think about. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think it's always important to keep those things in mind and just tr- try to like think of all possible scenarios where th- whatever you're building, where where that really has effects. Because um, otherwise, we do fall into this like all of a sudden we're there and we're like, uh oh, now what do we do? <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, we're ha- we're approaching that uh oh mo- moment. You think so? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Seems like it. Well, thank you so much for talking with us, and um, we learned a lot, and it was a really interesting chat with you and learning about biomechatronics. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa. Thanks, Anna. It's great to be here, and uh, I'm excited about this podcast. Keep doing it. And now, my favorite part of the episode, where we talk about science fails. Steve has something really interesting to say, that he didn't believe that there was such a thing as a research fail. Yeah, that was really interesting. I mean, I see that there is a good point in that, and that any fail that you have or mistake can be a learning experience, and therefore it would not be 
of failure. But sometimes I do things that really do just seem like a failure. <laughs> Wait, if, if nothing's a fail, then is everything a fail? If a fail happens and no one's there to <laughs> hear it, is was it, it really a fail? A fail? <laughs> We're getting really philosophical wow. today. Do you need to have a witness for it to be a fail? Can I get a witness for my fail? <laughs> yes, we. you can. Here on Boom, you can get a witness for your fail. Would you like to share... Um, a research fail that someone sent you, Hannah? Yes. Uh, one of our coveted Boom listeners sent in a research fail, and she said that she shifted projects. So to, she used to do human experiments, was got really used to motion capture, things like that, but then transitioned to a more design project, and she's working with some motors, you know, the Arduino breadboard, all that fun circuit stuff that I know nothing about, so forgive me if that was wrong. And she was refreshing herself on motors. She spent like a day trying to get her motors to work, trying to read all up on them, figuring like she had connected some wire the wrong way. No, she had done it all right. She could not figure it out. She finally comes to that moment where she asks a lab mate for help with motors, who's a little bit more experienced than her. And they look over at her setup and they are like, I think you just want to plug it in. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Uh, classic, not classic. plugged in. Classic, like, not plugged in. We don't want to be that person that has to tell them that it's not plugged in. <laughs> Wait, are we recording right now? Some mics aren't plugged in. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, that was a bad joke. I got so. it. Wow. Well, I had a um, research fail this week. I am using this machine that costs uh, millions of dollars to image <laughs> um, muscle in vivo, which is really cool and exciting. But one of the things that the guy who built it told me not to do was to leave the key in the side of it while I was moving the machine. So it has a key that can turn on the laser and it sticks out from the machine. And I think he told me three or four times to remember to move the key because it is a, it's a not designed well because the key sticks out from the side. And I decided to move the machine and I did not remove the key. So I did exactly what he told me not to do and uh, knocked it on the door um, and the key and everything it was connected to just broke off <laughs> on the machine. So it's not working, and we have to send it across the country to get fixed, and it's going to be Germany? a couple weeks. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yes, and the other side of the country, which would be Germany. Actually, yeah, they, they might have to send it to Germany. I'm being serious. No, and they, that's why I thought. I yeah, that yeah, thing. so they're sending it to New York first and then to, okay, Germany. Then to there's Germany. a whole There's a whole wow. process situation it's going on a grand to tour. happen. <laughs> yeah, maybe it will send me a postcard. <laughs> oh, love <laughs> from the zebra school. It's really sad because then it's just weeks of not being able to use it and kind of emphasized I guess why grad school takes so long thank you Hannah gave me a hug just now <laughs> <laughs> I mean honestly my mom so when we were little I would always be impatient because she was always late everywhere and unfortunately I've adopted her qualities there she's a great mm -hmm. person though regardless of that you know quality but whenever we'd get somewhere late I'd my sister and I would be really mad because we were late and we we're like man we could have been here earlier and um, we're not just talking like five minutes late she'd be like you know an hour late right but she'd always be like you never know. We could have gotten in an accident on the way here. Like, if we had been an hour, if we yeah, had been on time, yeah. she'd always pull one of those. But, and now, you know, I'd always be like, that's dumb. But <laughs> now, you know, it's a, not a bad way of looking at things. So you never know if you hadn't done whatever you did to this zebra scope maybe something worse could have happened. That's true. And it, what maybe it, I would like, have accidentally pushed it over the ledge on the way out. Yes. Well, I think that's all for research fails. Do you have any? Never Seems failed. like I'm the only one that's <laughs> failing around here, so. I don't do research, so you're I don't really, have any You're fails. failing at failing right now. I, re I like accidentally started to recruit a person who was under the age of the age span that we were recruiting, and we like went mm -hmm. through par like almost halfway through like, an interview, and then I was like, oh, now we have to check through the inclusion-exclusion criteria, and they were like, oh, you can stop right there because I'm, you know, X age, and I was like, oh, well, have a great day. <laughs> it's nice Thank you learning and about goodbye. your life. <laughs> so that happened. Well, that's, that's something. Thanks for sharing your research fail. Thanks for sharing your research fail. You're very welcome.
So Boom is made possible by the International Society of Biomechanics. And I talked about this a little bit the first episode. Being the student representative for ISB is an honor for me. And I'm really excited for the podcast and that we're able to make it through ISB. And ISB provides a lot of other opportunities for for their student members, such as offering mentors around the world, offering student grants and other sources of funding and an awesome congress every two years. And as we mentioned in the episode with Felipe Carpus, there's a really awesome opportunity through ISB to go and work in economically developing countries or come from an economically developing country and work in another lab. And then there's also just student grants where you can apply to go do research abroad somewhere, which I was able to do at the University of Cape Town. And next episode, spoiler alert, we are interviewing two of the professors that I worked with at the University of Cape Town, and I'm really happy to kind of circle back and talk with them. And so I, I, through ISB, I went and worked at the University of Cape Town for about five months on a research project there. And it was really one of the best experiences of my life. And I am so thankful for the opportunity from ISB. And so if you want to become a member of ISB, a student member or just a general member, you can go on to the International Society of Biomechanics website and become a member there. You can also follow the International Society of Biomechanics on Twitter at IS Biomechanics as well as Facebook. I have something to tell you. I got a Twitter. Hannah O'Day has a Twitter, everyone. I have no followers and I don't follow anyone yet. I haven't, well, we haven't promoted our own Twitter handle. Um, Oh, right. We've just been doing it. But I think, but you can follow Hannah at, (laughs) what's your Twitter, Hannah? I don't think they want to know. No, they want to know. I want to know. I need to follow you. It's, um, my real name is Johanna. So it's at J-O-H-A-N, like the Mm -hmm. B name Johanna. Ping, like ping pong, P I N G. <laughs> Johan Ping. It's at Johan Ping. Johan Ping. Okay. Mm-hmm. I was checking mine because I don't remember. Mine mine is Melissa Boswell underscore. Like the underscore the underscore's symbol. after? Yeah, it's Melissa Boswell. Space. And then a, no, just no space. space. Just the underscore symbol after Boswell. Is it silent? Or do you say Melissa Boswell underscore? Well, I just said it. <laughs> With the underscore. <laughs> so clearly with the What underscore. kind of sound does it have? But, but if it's a visual thing, I don't pronounce it if somebody can see it, I guess. Anyways, I'm not really great at tweeting on social media. I need to get better at it. I've been trying with ISB, but if anyone has some advice on how to have a better social media presence, I think that would be something cool to talk about. Because a lot of people on Twitter, when I go through now, they have a lot of cool things to say, and people are sharing their research on Twitter. Wow. And, yeah, it's, I think it's a really, really great platform to talk about biomechanics because I'm sure that's the only thing that people want to use Twitter that's for all they is need biomechanics. Twitter for. That's why I got it. So. <laughs> yeah, and along those same lines... If you guys have anything that you are thinking you'd like to hear about on Boom or ideas you think you'd like us to do, Professor Steve Collins mentioned doing some kind of debates or maybe talking about some controversial topics in biomechanics. Mm-hmm. So if you have any any of those you'd like some juicy details on, we're happy to to get the people yeah, in here, some spicy do some talking, debates. do some spicy talking. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks for listening and biomechanics, biomechanics off, off our minds. minds. Boom. Boom.